And now, coming to you from the Pensado Media Center, powered by Westlake Pro. Hitmaker to star maker, you'll learn how. Judging underway for the Avid Westlake Pro Remix Contest, the Pensado Awards are rolling. We got a brand new ITL, we're chock-a-block full. You're at the place, mm -hmm. it's Pensado's place. Yeah. Thanks for dropping by. That uh, was a new feels, thing. Feels like I learned that from Changor. <laughs> oh, okay. It, it, okay. It, it feels like there's electricity in the room today or something. Yeah, it's it's, kinda it's, cool. it's good energy, right? We got yeah. a lot to get to, shall we? My friend Fab's here. Oh, good. Absolutely. You named the studio after Fab, right? Oh, we did. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Shall we get started? Yeah. Good. Let's do that. Hey, folks, it is great to see you and hope you are well. Shout out to our amazing partners. They are 1500 or Nothing, yeah, yeah. the Blackbird Academy, Westlake Pro, Avid, Heaviosity, Nam, Lander, and Fab Factory. Mm -hmm. Judging underway for the We Are All Ye Got remix contest, that's Avid and Westlake Pro's beautiful thing where we get to judge whether you can also mix and also create something new, which would be a remix. Those puppies are all being submitted, judging is starting, then we'll get them to Dave, he'll evaluate, and we will pick some winners. You know we got some cool prizes for you and you're gonna appear on the show and we're going to see what you can do. So let's get to it. Make sure you've got everything in, and we will be judging and announcing very soon, Can't correct? Wait. Can't wait. And December 3rd, the Pensado Awards are jumping off. Tickets are going super fast, but you can still get yours. Come mix and mingle with the very best audio pros in the game. It's a built-in opportunity to not only celebrate, but to network with the very cream of the crop. Greg Wells is our giant award winner, such an amazing guy. Facebook and YouTube are coming and a whole bunch of other stuff. We're going to end the thing with a very special birthday celebration after the show. For info, go to PinsadaAwards.com. Get your tickets right now. Put on your rock and roll finery. Ladies, please attend. Students, if you're listening, it's a great opportunity for you. You won't find a better price ticket to a high-powered hang. Come on and see us. We're looking forward. Um, Always we like to do this periodically is thank folks for all your mixed submissions for Dave and so so forth. Keep yeah. them coming. It's good. It's been a, a steady flow. You and Chong have been busy shooting ITLs. What yeah, you got, got for we us? We got some good ones. I was experimenting with an Ottawa on a Don Diablo track mm -hmm. featuring Arizona that I really like. Okay. Can't wait for you guys to check it out. Let's roll it. Every once in a while, I do something that I, I really want to share with you guys. I've done bits and pieces of this before, but I'm showing it to you now inside a song, and I think that this is a pretty cool thing that might inspire you to try some new ideas with the same concept. This is one of my favorite groups called Arizona. They're a feature with uh, one of my favorite DJs, Don Diablo, uh, from Holland. This song's doing pretty well. It's called Take Her Place. I only listened to this song two million times. Uh, it's on Spotify. It's doing real well. Now, what I wanted to do was I had a bass sound, and this is the this this essentially the bass sound that I had. Pretty cool, real cool, extremely cool. Don's brilliant, brilliant producer, but I wanted a, I wanted a little attitude, so I took a an Ottawa that I've had for probably 40 years. The settings that you see on it are the settings that uh, I actually used. And I recorded this. You can't listen to that without your mouth moving. You, like, you, you, you go. It's so weird, you have to do that. And, and to make matters, I don't know, better or worse, this is actually a comp. So these pink pieces, we actually recorded three versions of it because the wah is triggering different at different times. And so I wanted da 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 and, 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 and so sometimes I didn't get it. Here's another one. You know what I'm saying? We recorded these so that we could find different ones. And some of these are from here and they're all mixed up. Now, how does that fit with, with the, the original uh, bass line? Check this out. That's pretty cool. So did a little bit of EQ, 
took off a little bit of top. And then uh, one of my favorite plugins, uh, Gr you know, Greg and the boys over at Kush Audio. This thing's so cool. In the track, this is what you got. Right off camera, you can't see Changor dancing. So guys, as always, you don't have to use a wah-wah pedal. Sometimes you might want to use a, an envelope follower, or sometimes you might want to use a distortion pedal. One of my favorite ones is this DOD envelope follower. I use this on a lot of big records. So the way I run it is I use the Radial Engineering EXTC. It's great for getting in and out of a DAW, but uh, experiment and you'll find a lot of uses for guitar pedals, especially with bass. See you next time. Adios. Going from being a hip maker to a star maker, that is, uh, that is a task, and you're going to hear what that's about. Uh, the list of both, hits and stars, is long and illustrious. We've been after this guy for a minute. Please welcome to the desk, J.R. Rosen. Thank hey, you bro. very much for having How me. How are you, man? JR, buddy, great to, to have you. you. Thank you, guys. W where did it all begin? Where was home? What, what started you? Was it uh, instruments? Yeah, definitely. It started off as a piano, mm -hmm. classical piano. Mm -hmm. um, I was fortunate that I had parents who supported and saw my talent in music at an early age. Mm -hmm. So basically from age four, I started classical piano lessons. Oh, wow. And so I did that pretty much uh, all through, you know, my childhood through high school. Mm -hmm. At that point, you know, I was always into keyboards and kind of sequencing and things like that. But um, I was mainly a classical pianist and I decided that I wanted to uh, go into film scoring. Mm. So that's what brought me to Berklee College of Music initially ah, in Berkeley. Boston. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, my life took a different turn when I got there. I just uh, got immersed into jazz mm. because, um, you know, I had very, very strict classical teachers. Mm -hmm. So it was good. But, you know, classical teachers can sometimes be snobby towards any other kind of music. Absolutely. Improvisational and all that kind of stuff. So I was kind of deprived from jazz. So when I got to Berkeley and it was, you know, total freedom in every way, like, you know, first of all, living on my own yeah. and just the crazy, crazy life, you know. You're like, jazz, I yeah. can go crazy. Crazy. So, you know, for me, I'm kind of, I have an extreme personality and an, an no. addictive one. No, not you. <laughs> so, so when I got there, it was just, you know, that's all I wanted to do. I, I pretty quickly, you know, got out of film scoring, ended up uh, gearing myself more into jazz arranging because mm -hmm. I always felt like... Um, composing and sequencing and making beats it was always in me but I basically just you know kind of locked myself in the practice room and uh, just learned jazz you know eight twelve hours a day wow. um, flong sort of thing I mean maybe mm -hmm. it's more of a spiritual kind of conversation but, but checking the ego mm -hmm. and, and kind of trying to stay in that humble place is just uh, you know it, it's a, it's a will, daily struggle and it will check you it will right. it will <laughs> so after a while it was like okay I'm playing cool gigs, but it's also like weddings, bar mitzvahs, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. I was mm -hmm. like, I wanna, I, I want something more than this. Mm -hmm. So um, I was really, really into hip hop. And at that time I was like, okay, I wanna just start making beats. So I started making beats, didn't have any connections. This is up in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And um, I would just pass out my beat CDs to anyone who would, who would want them. We went to, uh, me and my brother flew to like, I think there was urban music convention in Texas mm -hmm. at the time. And mm -hmm. just, we would burn, you know, at that time on a, on a computer, a hundred CDs of Absolutely. beats. So my music got to Dwayne Wiggins of Tony, Tony, sure. Tony. Sure. Sure. Good you know, friend. yeah, so he's one of the bigger cats in the Bay Area. Yeah. And he was actually the one who signed Destiny's Child to Columbia That's right. back in the That's day. Exactly right. So he took one, a couple of my tracks and, um, you know, gave it to Beyonce and Destiny's Child at the time. This was during the Survivor album. Mm -hmm. And um, before I knew it, I was like, whoa, it was, you know, that was probably one of the most exhilarating moments still till this day sure. to hear like Beyonce, like on my, on my track. So, um, and this was pre Beyonce, like it was, yeah, Destiny's exactly. Child, this Beyonce. was Destiny's Child. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that was very, very exciting. And I felt like that was uh, kind of the universe telling me, okay, you know, you can you can do this. Yep. You know, I thought it was going to be a lot easier. I thought I was going to get that placement, move to LA, 
and just become the biggest producer overnight. Sure. But you know, I found out that I had to pay a lot more dues than that. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, also you know, didn't quite get my due production credit like many of us. Like, uh, we like, all know that like story. It happens, absolutely. So so I moved down, and uh, you know, my biggest influence was Dr. Dre, mm, and uh, this was around the time he, he was doing Chronic 2001, and mm -hmm. you know, in because I my ear was so unrefined, I just thought, oh yeah, my beats are you know on on this level. Like mm -hmm. I I couldn't. I didn't have the you know refinement to understand how how much below you know that quality that was. Sure. Basically, stick with Dr. Dre for a second. Sure. I just want to see if you agree with this. You know, when we when other people here on the show have talked about Dr. Dre, when we think about Dr. Dre, the level of depth that he put into just the tracks, the hooks that were buried in hooks that were buried in hooks that absolutely. Just, would absolutely, you didn't know what you were influenced by, but you were just under a spell before you even listened to a vocal. Totally. And he just knew and intuitively understood how to do that. Is that fair? Is that uh, to totally fair. I, I feel mm -hmm. the exact same way. He, like for me, um, you know, I was, I, I, rap and hip hop always was just a, uh, a mystical thing for me. When mm -hmm. I first heard like Run DMC, mm -hmm. Raising Hell, that was when I was first like, I didn't even know what rap was. I was like, I don't know what this is, but is. Uh, this is for me. Yeah, yeah. You know, but in terms of wanting to produce, it was Dr. Dre when I heard, you know, his like um, a little bit NWA, but really his first Chronic album yeah. and Snoop Dogg, Doggy Style. Yeah. Like you said, um, when I heard those beats, I was like, and, I, and at the time I wasn't, I didn't even know that there was a sampling interpolating going on from mm -hmm. P-Funk and all mm -hmm. that stuff. Mm -hmm. So it was all new sounds to me, but all, but just the way it was put together, um, and even even the cleanliness of the mix, because at that yeah. time there was East Coast and West Coast hip hop, yeah. and, and East Coast was grimier and dirtier yeah. and that kind of stuff. But I was so you know there was just something like the, the, like you said. I think what he does, um, which I wish I could do better, is he has an economy in his beats. Mm -hmm. It's like he doesn't have layers of twenty things going on. Mm -hmm. He's just got the right thing. He's he's it's a filet mignon. He's mm -hmm. got all the fat cut out. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. just like he's got one. You know the right snare drum sound, the right kick drum sound, yeah. the right like riff, and there's not too many things happening. But he doesn't have to overcompensate. It's not, he doesn't have a bunch of mediocre things going on. Right. He's just got the perfect, perfect it's, thing. It's all high end stuff. It's, it's all farm to table. Totally. You know. And, totally. And then he also, in in because he's so specific with everything, you also end up with this sort of I think Jimmy called it this kind of Phil Spector wall of sound. Mm -hmm. So the power of it somehow it gets out of all that economy in ways that just go, it just like kill, it just yeah, knocks it, you as amazing. It hits, it hits you in the face. Yeah. I mean, still, you know, yeah, still till this day, I, you know, I, I AB my stuff, mm -hmm. you know, just in, all, in every way, sonically, mm -hmm. mix-wise, you know, mm -hmm. beat-wise, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, so it was my dream, you know, really my dream was to move to LA and play keys for Dr. Dre. Mm -hmm. And at the time, you know, I didn't know about Scott Storch or anything like that. So I had this fantasy, I'm gonna be the first white Jewish <laughs> keyboard player that's gonna be in with, with Dr. Dre. And when I moved down here, they're like, do you know, you don't know who Scott is? Right. I was like, oh shit, no. So, <laughs> so, so being the second would be, yeah, but no. <laughs> yeah, so, so, but really though, but it was kind of, um, inspirational to me because I was like, oh, okay, so this is possible. Things, a few like signposts made me feel like, okay, this is possible. Absolutely. So, um, you know, that was kind of my original goal. Um, and I did do a couple sessions with Dr. Dre. Obviously, it didn't become a relationship like he had with Scott or with Mike Elizondo or these sure. cats. I just think it was, you know, the chemistry was it was cool, but yeah, it was, yeah. you know, yep. it was whatever. So, and then, um, and at the time, you know, Zach had said, you know, don't worry about it. You're going to be your own uh, producer one day. You're not going to be a keyboardist for somebody else. Right. So, um, it worked basic, out pretty well. It worked out. <laughs> yeah, so so yeah. basically, yeah, long story short, through through a little bit of outside influence, like, hey, that's a good track, that's not such a good track. If you make the drums a little dirtier on that, we can change that. And then just we started sending beats out, and at that time fl flying to New York, and we'd go to a studio session at, like, Sony Studios mm -hmm. and just, you know, play a bunch of beats for 50 Cent or Lil' Kim mm -hmm. or, you know, out here, Snoop Dogg and, and different people. And... Uh, you know, the industry was a little different. Album cuts mattered a lot yes, more. Yes, they did. Um, it was, uh, you know, I didn't know what I was doing as far as making hits at the time, but I was just thrilled to be in the room with these people. Mm -hmm. And honestly, um, it was like uh, they were, the beats were kind of like flying off the shelves. It was like, you know, we'd go with Lil' Kim and she'd be like, okay, I want track two, seven, and nine. You Boom. Like, yes. You know, then we'd go to the to the next studio and, you know, 50 Cent would be like, you know, I, I think you have your pulse on what G unit is doing. Lloyd Banks wants this one. Mm -hmm. I want this one. Nice. You know, um, you know, Young Buck wants this one. So it just kind of, um, you know, had kind of like a breakout few years of, of just placing a lot of, uh, 
a lot of rap tracks. Yeah. And, and, and the corollary, I think, and see if you think, is, and you've mentioned this a number of times in the interview, these different lucky breaks, they are strangely attached to hard work. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, lucky breaks are knowing that you're ready when the opportunity comes. True. And then being able to step in with the goods. If you're not doing the other part of it, a lucky break will go right by you. To I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. I, I feel like, um, you know, to me, the, the three, like, fundamental, you know, keys, I think, to success, just boiling it down, is, is you know, relentless hard work, mm -hmm. um, faith, Absolutely. And, uh, and, and for me, positivity. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not always, uh, I don't always live up to those, but, mm -hmm. that, but I know that but when I, human. Well, yeah, but yeah. when I look back on, you know, all the things that happened for me, which I look at as, you know, blessings from above, mm -hmm. um, I think it's a, a combination of those things. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, in music, I mean, you guys know this in a creative thing, you could be in the studio for 12 hours a day, put in the hours, but if, you're, if you feel uninspired or have negative energy or, or that kind of stuff, you could just be banging your head. And you know, we're not accountants, so just putting in 12 hours in the studio without magic can result in nothing. Mm -hmm. But, um, and not that I do this, but I imagine people like maybe Rick Rubin do, like you could meditate for 10 hours mm -hmm. um, and then come into the studio and then in five minutes, like in, do something inspirational that will change the whole rest mm -hmm. of your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I do agree with you that, um, you know, for me, the work ethic always came easy. Mm -hmm. I had the discipline and I had the fire. Mm -hmm. Um, but sometimes showing up without ego, without feeling competition, without feeling like, man, why is, you know, that guy's, that guy's killing it, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. When th the combination of those things, the hard mm -hmm. work and the coming from the right place, mm -hmm. I think is what, you know, where the good stuff comes from. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that you would say in your experience, you know, we, you work with all types of personalities, right? There's some who are kind of laissez-faire and there's stuff like JR is driven and there's different. But at some point in time, we all come to that crossroad where you got to deliver the goods at the time and the goods are judged by everybody and you don't get away from that. And ultimately, if you can't reach that bar, you can't sort of get to what we're talking about. Yeah. Like it does, your path getting there may be different, but once you get to the place, yeah. it's the same place. Do you agree? Yeah, 100%. Um, I was listening to the new Weezer, it feels like summer. Hmm. And it kind of embodies everything you've talked about up to this point. I mean, it's got hip hop in it, it's got rock, it's got melody, it's got, are you pretty proud of that? Do you think that's? Well, you know, it's funny, and I, I, don't, I, I don't mean to come off like false humble, because that, that's really annoying you, I, when, when you do that, but I, I, feel, I, I do feel proud of it, but I also, you know, I feel more lucky and blessed because, um, you know, it's, it's like the, the whole rock stuff that I'm doing now, kind of the, the first taste of that came from Centuries Fall Out Boy. Mm, and right, I can't right. sit here and say, you know, I, I sat there in a room and I decided, I, de I envisioned, I want to move, I want to do rock and this is how I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. So some of those things really started out as, you know, with, with Centuries, it was like, okay, I, I wanted to flip that Suzanne Vega thing, da, 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 yep. da. So Tom's I did Diner. that. Uh, so yeah, exactly, Tom's Diner. And uh, I did that. Um, I added some kind of like break beady rock sounding drums and, mm -hmm. and then I was in with, uh, you know, at the time, a, a new writer, Justin Tranter, who's mm -hmm. really one of the top writers right yeah, now, and, uh, and Raja. And we did that hook and at the time we're like, oh, it'd be so cool if Rihanna did this or at the time we're like, oh, maybe it'd be a rapper, maybe it'd be like Travis Barker or something. Mm -hmm. And they happen to have the same management as Fall Out Boy oh. and they gave it to Fall Out Boy and I was like, okay, I'll take it. Cool. And, then, and then, you know, I was lucky, Fall Out Boy like loved it and they filled in the blanks, did their verses, added live instruments. Then I got the stems of the live instruments. And then I think um, it was just, just kind of in the magic of how much live stuff and how much program stuff am I, am I gonna do? And mm. it was kind of cool that they were open to a reinvention of, mm -hmm. of taking an outside track and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And, uh, and, you know, the Feels Like Summer and, and that kind of stuff and the Panic at the Disco, kind of similar stuff. You know, I, yeah. it's very, I found at least for me, again, the good stuff that I've done, I may have thought I'm coming into, hey, I want to do a Rihanna song, but it went this way. Mm -hmm. I may have thought, um, you know, like with, with Sean Kingston, who I know we're going to get to, Beautiful Girls. When I came in the studio that day, I didn't think we we're going to do Beautiful mm -hmm. Girls. We were mm -hmm. working on some pretty good song, like a seven or an eight, and how do we perfect it? Mm -hmm. And then that just came about. Mm -hmm. So in, at least in, in my life, I think other people's karma is extremely focused vision and they actually manifest exactly what they see. Mm -hmm. But I think in, for me, it's always been like, okay, you know, hard work and positive energy and all that stuff. And you think it's gonna be for this, but we're gonna surprise you and it's gonna go in a completely different direction. I think that part of what is great for our audience is to know, to stay open to that kind of 
process coming in? You know, it's a funny thing. It's like the, the good things come when you're in that open, humble, creative space. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then, and then you get like all the, you know, the goodies, whatever, the success, mm -hmm. the, the chart placement, mm -hmm. financial success, all that stuff. And then you find yourself, maybe it's just the human ego. Now, th those are the, like, the repercussions of being in that good thing. But now you find yourself chasing those Ooh. symbols. And it's ironically, and, that's, and you come into the studio and you're like, okay, I gotta make a hit now, because I, you know, I want a bigger house and I want a bigger car and I want, I want a more number ones. And that's actually, at least for me, when I'm like, when I come up with just Dang. shit, just bullshit. It's, it's a dangerous space. It, and it's yeah. very, very difficult. You know, as I said, the easy part is showing up and putting in the hours, but the hard part is, uh, is is remaining in that in that open you know place don't you we, know don't we know that you know it's 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 kind of like a, it's a it's a lifelong sort of thing I mean maybe mm -hmm. it's more of a spiritual kind of conversation but, but checking the ego mm -hmm. and and kind of trying to stay in that humble place is just uh, you know it, it's a, it's a it daily will, struggle. You write a lot of stuff for Empire. What's the difference between writing for a TV show and then writing for the general public? Is is there a process change for you when you're doing that? Um, it, and do it, you enjoy it? It, uh, good question. Um, it's, <laughs> the it's, deadlines are brutal. The de well, the deadlines are totally different. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the biggest change. Mm -hmm. And um, just to you know make a distinction, like uh, so, Empire. You know, we're doing like songs similar to what we would do in radio. Yeah. Whereas you know, there's some other stuff I'm doing where it's underscore, which is a totally different thing. But yeah. as far as Empire, since there's specifically it's a show about the music industry and it lends itself to making pop urban songs, mm -hmm. you know, that you would make. The thing about it is because of the deadlines, it's like, um, and because of the like, kind of like the limited writers that you can use based on, you know, publishing rules and all that kind of stuff, it's a little bit more like, um, instead of having this just open freedom of like, you know, just doing an album, it's like, okay, we need a song uh, that hits this plot point and this plot twist, but you can't say it on the nose or it's going to be right. cheesy. It's got to also be able to play on iTunes and, and stand right. on its own two feet for somebody who hasn't also seen mm -hmm. the episode. Mm -hmm. um, so, so in other words, there's all the, there's all these um, limitations. Sure. It's got to be this. It's got to be that. It's got to sound like this. The ref is uh, this Alicia Keys song, mm -hmm. but we want it to be a little bit more like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So I think I think there's a lot of people, maybe people who are maybe you know, to their credit, more creative, more creative and mm -hmm. more talented than me and, and less willing to compromise, who'd be like, fuck this, this is not mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. But there's a side of me, um, I like efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, my, mm -hmm. my engineer always jokes about the fact that we're the, we're the most efficient, like, we're mm -hmm. the most efficient, because I like the way we comp vocals, the way we do stuff is very, very mathematical. Mm -hmm. A little bit of that is a, as a result of my kind of OCD personality mm -hmm. of organization. Mm -hmm. But there's kind of a thrill that I get in, okay, how do we make the best possible song with these tools, with, with this small group of writers mm -hmm. that, I, that I'm, you know, that I'm given? It's not like, you know, I'm like Sia's coming in, right. you know, to write for right. this right. or, uh, you know, whatever. So it's like, I'll, how do we make the song fit exactly what the producers want within the time frame? And then they need it like, you know, mixed. And, um, and if they have like quick edits and, you know, there's certain lyrics that you can't say, oh, you know, we can't say Ferrari, it's not a sponsor, sure. you know, this or that. So it's very, very different. Um, a lot more limitations, a lot less time. Mm -hmm. It's more about how do you balance highest possible quality within that framework mm -hmm. as opposed to just, you know, how do we make a song? We have six months right now right. to make a song or an album that's going to, you know, change music. It's not that. The people who have been on the show that started uh, doing commercials mm -hmm. and then turn that into pop careers, always go back to that taught them efficiency. They don't have to get there in the morning, maybe turn stuff out by the end of the day, had to hit certain marks, had to have it judged by a committee of people. Totally. Had to change it quickly and make a deadline. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, and, uh, and the changes are a little different. Like when you're in, in the music industry, you know, you have an A&R, an you know, who might they might get a little bit more like, hey, that, I need it. The shaker doesn't sound right. right. I don't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the TV people, which is kind of, they're never that. They're not, it's that a, they're not that specific. They're mm -hmm. never telling me to change my snare mm -hmm. sound. It's more like I'm not feeling the. Yeah, it, it's more like oh, <laughs> uh, it needs this. needs to be like just way faster yeah, or something like yeah, that. So exactly. so I can so it's actually like there's a little bit more freedom in the sense of like how I'm. They're like just do what you do, but it's just got to be shorter mm -hmm. or, and don't say that word or. And you or, can fool them. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> on exactly. The, on the new Gwen Stefani album, you did almost the whole damn album. Uh, great work, by the way. Thank you, I appreciate that. The, pro the creative process on that, did you, do you sit down with Gwen and ask her what she wants to 
talk about, or how do the songs come together? Are you sitting at a piano when you work with her? Or? Um, again, another lucky break. That that kind of whole situation started off as um, a session, like, hey, let's let's get in, let's try this out, and um, you know, I didn't know what to expect because obviously, you know, I'm sure we're all fans of hers. She's mm -hmm. a superstar. She's she's done so much great stuff, yeah. and um, I was so blown away by like how humble and open she was in the ratio to what a superstar and, and what she's done. And also, um, she came in, I didn't know it at the time, but she was in a very transitional point in her personal life, uh -huh. you know, separating from her yeah. husband and, and moving on to, to the new lover of her life. And yeah. she didn't, uh, in, in the first session or two, she didn't say that verbatim, but when she started, you know, showing us, she had all these like lyrics and notes in kind of a poetry book. Mm -hmm. she, she sort of, that was sort of her process. A lot mm -hmm. of it was like just lyrics and, and, and titles. And we started, you know, a lot of it was about, you know, like, hey, uh, Mr. Like, uh, this, you're being deceptive here and, mm -hmm. and this and that. And we mm -hmm. started piecing it together like, like oh, okay. You, like, this, songs like Used to Love You. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so it would go a lot of different ways. You know, we have a piano room where, where it was a more heartfelt song where, you know, I'd sit down at the piano and start playing chords. Then it was other times where she'd, you know, she would kind of like, hey, start doing something. She has, she loves a lot of like urban stuff and, mm -hmm. and, and cool things. So she's like, start making a beat. Like I'd start putting on like an 808 thing and 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 kind of a, a simple thing. She's like, oh, I like that. But then let's go, you know, let's go 80s, like Cindy mm -hmm. Lauper kind of chords on this. And mm -hmm. when you have, you know, like a Gwen Stefani, it's like, okay, this is what I'm going through in my life right now. And I felt like those sessions were kind of, therapy for her probably, like writing about cathartic. yeah exactly yeah. it was cathartic yeah. your approach to mixing is it you use one person are you hands-on hands away what do you um i you know i'm i'm pretty particular about the sonics yeah I, why why would i think anything else <laughs> other than that? yeah of course I, yeah i'm pretty particular just pure you could just, just fill in fill in the blank life. absolutely have anything right. um yeah i am and um who do you use my engineer now um who works with me um He's my right hand, Sam Kalonjian. I think we get things to, you know, a pretty, uh, a pretty advanced level as far as like how we really want to hear it. Sure. It's not, it's not like the, we're not sending stuff to the mixer zeroed out. I mean, I know right. no one is these days, right. you know. Right, I get it. Um, so it's kind of like we get a, a rough balance of, of where we're at. But then, you know, we like to send it off to another mixer because, again, they have a completely different Your perspective. Because he was there tracking everything with me and, and doing that. So mm -hmm. he's a little bit, you know, his vision is a little too close to mine. Mm -hmm. I guess it depends on the genre, right. and it also depends on the artist that I'm working with. I hope, yeah. Weezer, Tony Maserati, he killed that track. He to killed Tony that Maserati. track. And I think he might have been the first one who, he may have mixed uh, the fancy song that I did on Destiny's Child back when I didn't know wow. mixers. There was a song Destiny's Child did called My Song. And you mixed that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was the cheesiest set I didn't know it ever. Then. <laughs> no, yeah. So we've, so we've worked together. We worked together at the beginning of my career. I'll yeah. be darned. He um, actually moved to L.A. because of that song. Well, uh, just to so stay on top of you so you didn't mess it up. Just change the subject. Martin, Martin uh, Estevez. Yes. Uh, tell me about this. One of one of my passions, obviously, I, I'm a song guy. I love producing songs. I would, you know, produce songs for any for any artist that I'm that I like. But signing my own artist to my right. label is a it's 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 like a different level. It's yeah. a different level of commitment. Yes. When it works, it's 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 more rewarding. When it doesn't work, you want to pull your hair out. Absolutely. I've, I've uh, you know bet on the wrong horse and spent six months developing. Mm -hmm. You know, an artist took me out of the game of producing. Yeah, yeah. You know, outside people. So I've I've made my share of mistakes, mm -hmm. um, but you know, with Sean Kingston and Jason Derulo, a couple other people, Ayaz and Man, it, it panned out. And um, Martine sort of represents um, a little bit of a, of a new chapter in, in my life as an executive, as mm -hmm. far as, as mm -hmm. far as artists in a, in a number of ways. First of all, it's, um, it's, it's my new venture with Warner Brothers called Lion Estates. Oh, cool, congrats. Uh, thank you, and so he's the catalyst for that. Great. We all know the industry is very different now, you know, Spotify, all the, you know, social media, all that kind of stuff. When we broke Sean and Jason, you know, I don't want to say that it was easy and maybe it was kind of, there was a little bit naive, but it was just like, hey, I like them. I'm yeah. going to work with them, you know, stumbled onto, you know, our first singles that became number ones and yeah. went straight to Kiss FM and Z100. And that was Off it. Yeah. There was, there was no fan base. Yeah. It was, it was very song driven. Mm -hmm. There was no setup. Um, I think in the industry now, you know, those stories, they still happen here and there, mm -hmm. um, but they're few and far between. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, having artists that are culturally relevant mm -hmm. and, um, you know, kind of, they sort of, it's not just about the songs. The songs, um, 
are maybe more pieces of their story. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the fans really, really want to connect with that. Mm -hmm. they, they, A, they want more content. You know, mm -hmm. it's not just now the record labels yep. that are putting out one single every six months. Yep. The fans want a new song once a month at least. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to build a story. Mm -hmm. and, um, and what is he talking about? And is it, is it authentic mm -hmm. and is it real? And I think with Martine, um, you know, first off, I, you know, it was uh, my friend Marty James mm -hmm. um, and collaborator, he, collaborator. He's a uh, co-writer on Despacito, one mm -hmm. of the biggest songs. Mm -hmm. He's from the Bay Area and so am I. And he brought me Martine. Um, he actually showed me just a YouTube video of him at 14 years old, you know, playing guitar. And I just got that feeling. I'm like, if this kid is anything like in person, like mm -hmm. he is on this, I'm like, this is my next artist mm -hmm. um, for, for just a number of reasons. You know, he's he's. He, he lives a certain lifestyle. He's, he, he's cousins with Kehlani. He represents a certain mm -hmm. Bay Area kind of sensibility. Mm -hmm. he, ha he has this very, very positive message of spreading love, which comes from, you know, some, some, uh, a little bit of a dark past. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's seen some stuff. He's seen some stuff. He's, he's, he has seen some stuff. So I think there's a certain cultural relevance and a story that he's trying to tell that is, even to him, it's like, it's more important to him than even having a hit. Well, speaking of a couple different worlds, let's go outside the studio. Chung, you got a couple questions? We got a lot of questions. This first one's from Fedor Debove. Oh, okay. my <laughs> What's your key to longevity in this industry? I think my personal key to longevity is, uh, is the combination of the versatility. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, being able to kind of reinvent myself in different genres. Mm -hmm. Like there was a time where you know I was the I was the hip hop guy. Mm -hmm. You know, now that's Metro Boomin. Right, right, right. You know, Absolutely. It, was, it was DJ Mustard. So yep. it's but so kind of pivoting and being able to embrace and really, really love working with different artists. Yeah. Um, the work ethic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, you know, I think just the the the, uh, the passion, like. I'm one track minded. I don't really have any other hobbies. Mm -hmm. You know, I still wake up every day, um, you know, just passionate to make magic, make mm -hmm. music, you know, when it just hits people, it just gives them that feeling. Mm -hmm. That's that's my reason for living. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I don't, you know, that's that hasn't faded. Um, you know, and the, I, I have no, like when people say, oh, you know, then you can retire at that. Like, I, I don't want that at all. Like for me, like I, I don't, I wouldn't really have a purpose to be on this earth Absolutely. if I, if I lost that. Yeah. Really? So it's that. There you go. Next one. This next one, Raphael Klondeist. If you need to fill in the low end of a beat, do you have a go-to instrument or element you would use? If I need to fill the low end of a beat, well, I guess it depends on the genre. Um, you know, some of that I would do with EQ. Like if we're... If I'm using a live bass, you know, which d isn't going to have like the low end necessarily of an 808 or something like that, you know, well, there's certain kind of plugins, R bass, that things that will give us like the, you know, the imitation of, of, a, of a bigger, yeah. bigger thing. Sometimes I will double. I use uh, Trillion quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I have kind of a go-to patch that's just super low stuff. I'll cut out the highs of it. And um, so if I have a bass that's more mid-rangey, um, and we're not able to just EQ, if it just doesn't have the load to, to boost up an EQ, I will double it from time to time. Um, and then, uh, you know, a lot of that is, is in the mix and, you know, a lot of like different stuff. Like now there's, you know, you say 808, back in the day there was one 808. Now there's tons of different 808 patches. Mm -hmm. There's ones that are, have more distortion to them. There's ones that have more subby. So we may have to switch patches if we're just not, if we're, we're kind of listening to it and we're like, I'm just not getting that satisfying feeling, then we will try to get the best out of it. And then after that, if we're not getting it, we're like, maybe I have the wrong patch here. I got to switch patches. Do you do any live stuff in your rock? We your do live stuff, yes, okay, sir. Okay, cool. Because somebody who's a musician like yours and also pushed an envelope, that's a natural yeah. place to go. All right, Mr. Sports Dude, um, the World Series is now over. I don't want to do it anymore. Oh, okay, cool. So you're on strike. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to get this from her. You I think so? I was throwing so? him off. That's a little curveball. Yeah, because right I saw you warming up. You're doing yeah, push-ups no, outside of the thing. Yeah. So, <laughs> All right, you ready to roll? I am. All right, batter's box is up. First pitch. Mini mood. Dre. Ooh, good. Fuck. <laughs> yeah. Genre. You're, you're in trouble. Hmm. I mean, I, I, I guess there's no wrong answer. Yeah. No, no. Uh, multi, like? multi, oh, multi genre. There you go. Answer. Strings. Strings. Wow. Uh, George Martin mm, from mm, the Beatles. Mm. Loops. Loops. Uh, breakbeat. Live drums. Live drums. As opposed to dead ones. <laughs> Live drums. Man, that's a good one. Uh, 
Yeah. Overdub. Because yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. you know, it's with yeah. where, the way we, I'm making music usually, it's like I'll use addictive drums to for live sounding drums. And then, you know, with some of this other stuff, like the Avril record I'm making right now, it's like, okay, we're going to replace these. So it's all, it's, it's, it's usually never a part of the initial process. Mm -hmm. It's overdubbing gotcha. for me. Okay, that was a good one word answer. <laughs> Sorry about uh, that. <laughs> reverb. Reverb. Um, Valhalla, I've been using Ooh, that one recently. I love Valhalla, yeah, nice. me too. Okay. Uh, virtual Sense. Virtual Sense. Omnisphere. 808s. It's so fundamental. It's life. Um, it's life, yeah. yeah. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's a it's a bigger part of my life than it should be, I guess. <laughs> All of us, really. Samples. Um, yeah, I my, yeah. my thing. I kind of yeah. <laughs> okay, excluding your children, your pets, um, your computer, your hard drives. If your studio caught fire, what one piece of gear would you rescue? Um, man, I'm so not sentimental about gear. I guess. Uh, I'll my motif, my, oh, okay. my, my motif. Good one. Good one. Yes, the yeah. Yamaha. That's that's kind of that's uh, you know before I got into soft synths, that was. There you go. So how did I do? Um, you no. did. What's that? I, I lost. Well, you did lose, but you did well. Why did he lose? I, I thought I lost. I, I couldn't stick to a one-word answer. No, you did. You just had one long one. Well, <laughs> yeah, and you know the the runner advanced. But it was a good long one. one. I was I, yeah, I was listening. Had, I didn't call yeah, him on it. It was like watching a base runner score, but walking all the bases. <laughs> he never took off running and got to home. So you and, did and, good. And, and he good. gave me a hand, ge hand gesture when he got to home. I'm glad you said hand <laughs> gesture. I didn't know where you were going. <laughs> so gave you a hand. A and, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's that's part two. That's pensado after dark. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, well, look, the, the, the clock goes fast. One of the things we want to make sure is that uh, if you're so inclined on December 3rd, you come to Pensado Awards. Would love to. That's the little muggy thing that we have right here. Uh, but beyond that, we have been fans of this immense talent mm. that you have that is absolutely supplanted with immense drive. I think it's a lesson for people to learn. I think the other lesson that is important to learn is that you at some point in time have to kind of curb that as well too, yeah, and direct it and not let it control you, and, and that that balance is important to get to. Is that fair? Yes, um, more than fair. And Dave, take us home. Okay, I'm 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 gonna let you guys help me because okay. I feel generous today. Oh, great! Thank you when, for that. When when I reviewed my thought process, because I've been a big fan for a long, long time, and I, I feel like I know his music, and there's several things that permeate your music, which I think are important to delineate and for the audience to know because it, it, you don't have to worry about genre. You, you can work, you could do a, a polka band and it would be great. You can do a hip hop band and it'd be great. So for me, you always maintain my interest. There's always something new coming along every four beats, every four bars. And then the drums are more than just timekeepers. They, they, they impart groove, they impart a sense of genre and they also impart that's in your face, they hurt you if you're not careful. And, and so the drums are always there. I never have to hunt for anything in your mixes. Uh, and, then, and then your sense of timing and groove, uh, thank God it's not jazz, it's something else. It, it, it has a Caribbean flavor to it. It has a, a little bit of Cuba in it. It has, it has a syncopation, not a syncopation, but sometimes you swing for a bar and then you don't for the next bar. It's just a really cool feel because it always maintains my interest. There's a question here somewhere. And then, and then the blend of something I recognize and something brand spanking new is in all, your, in all your work. And would you recommend that? First of all, do you think I'm right? And second, would you recommend that to our audience as a way to start their career to incorporate those elements into, um, into their work? Uh, well, first of all, thank you. I'm flattered by the, the kind but, words. Uh, but you know what I'm saying? Cause, I, I, but no. Despite the genre, you feel that because you're, you're real sensitive to those things, huh? I, I, well, I, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, I think uh, I think it's maybe a combination of uh, of things. First of all, I think when I first started making beats, they were actually maybe the opposite of that. They were very stiff. They were very ultra quantized and things like that. Um, and I think, and I was made aware of that. 
and I overcompensated by going to the to the other side and really really listening to to drummers to you know you know live stuff and and really really and I'm still listening to grooves like I'm sometimes I'm still kind of like you know I've never really done a song that was a hit that was like a four on the floor mm -hmm. my four on the floor still sounds very stiff and I'm always listening how how do you how do you make it like groove so mm -hmm. I always was studying what's happening in, in the in-betweens of the beats. There's, you know, there's mm -hmm. like what's one and three or two and four, mm -hmm. but whether it's Where's a hi-hat thing Where's that? or yeah. a shaker thing yeah. or, a, or a thing like that, um, you know, I think also listening to, uh, you know, a lot of jazz and things like that where feel, you know, everybody has a different swing. Everybody mm -hmm. has a different feel. And um, I just think being a student of that and having the commitment to incorporating that because, uh, you know, it's it's not a good feeling to have somebody say that, that feels stiff, and I've and I have you know had those criticisms before. So I just think my commitment and uh, and and being able to like listen to stuff and kind of analyze what's going on here. Oh, okay, that's these elements are maybe are quantized, but that's not, or it's maybe the bass that's a little bit imperfect that's giving it the groove. So I just think I'm a student of music, um, and when you're a student of uh, you know jazz and hip hop and and all this other stuff more so that than classical, you know. Um, you start kind of like acquiring, um, you know, like a taste in, for, for feel. Um, and I do, and as you said, you know, Caribbean, you know, reggae and things like that. I mean, Sean Kingston was my first artist. So mm -hmm. just listening to, you know, just Bob Marley and just different things and even dance hall and, and just um, the feel of stuff mm -hmm. is really, really, it's really, really important. There's your parting lesson scene. Say goodbye. See you next week. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.